Russia, home to the world's biggest natural gas reserves. The gas is needed, especially in Europe. And the end of the Cold War ushered in an era of conflicting energy dependencies and concern in the West. You're giving the Soviet Union hard currency and they're using that to build up their military and this is going to come back to haunt us. Meanwhile, the 1980s marked the beginning of one man's extraordinary career. As a case officer, you have to be able to manipulate people. There is no such a thing as former KGB guy. Gas is one of his two main tools for coercion, for leverage, for influence. Soviet traditions continue. Oil and gas. Oil and gas dependencies as a political weapon was par for the course in the Warsaw Pact. One of the world's most powerful men has strategically wielded what's probably his most effective weapon. With the help of Gazprom, Vladimir Putin has implemented policies designed to strike fear into the wider world. The whole purpose of Nord Stream was to be able to pressurize Central and Eastern Europe. Nord Stream 1 was a project aimed at allowing Russians to play hardball against us. The Yamal Peninsula in western Siberia. The region's indigenous people maintain thousand-year-old traditions on the tundra here. The Nainets are reindeer herders, and Maiko Serueto is their leader. He's responsible for this group of about 40 Nainets. They're on the move every day. It's going pretty well now. It's much more difficult in autumn. The Nainats migrate to keep their animals fed, but their route has become increasingly difficult in recent years. The once untouched nature of the Yamal Peninsula is no more. The hardest crossing is still ahead of us, Boban and Kovo. It's a long stretch with a wide river and concrete roads. Concrete roads bisect the tundra to provide access to one of Russia's largest natural gas deposits, the Bovaninkovo gas field, operated by Gazprom, the biggest extraction company in the world. The business of blue gold has been about politics, money, and above all, power, for decades. The people who are explorers in the energy industry are always looking for a giant. They're looking for a large field which has low unit cost, which will provide you with supply over 30 years. And there are very few giants left in the world that we know about. One country has benefited disproportionately. For Germany, the Russian hydrocarbon base, the gas base, is enormous. So for large supply, low unit cost, you can't do better on a pure economic basis than more cheap supply from Russia. Jürgen Hambrecht led BASF, the world's largest chemical company, for eight years. Gas means three things for BASF. Firstly, and most importantly, it's a raw material. Chemistry begins with the carbon atom. Secondly, we need a lot of heat. And thirdly, we also need electricity to run our plants. We need natural gas. BASF's gas strategy has always focused on one thing, risk minimization. That means access to oil and gas, which is why we wanted to source up to 50% of our carbon needs ourselves. That was the driving force behind everything we did. BASF, E.ON, and Gazprom signed a contract for the construction of a pipeline through the Baltic Sea just before the 2005 German parliamentary elections. We joined the joint venture to develop a new gas field in western Siberia in 2003. Then we said, OK, let's bring the cheap gas to Central Europe. The idea was to connect Germany via this pipeline to our gas fields, hence Nord Stream 1. 
und deshalb Nord Stream 1. Chancellor Gerhard Schröder had been a key ally of BASF for years. I have to represent German interests, especially when it comes to energy security for the German economy. Former NATO analyst Richard Anderson outlined in 2006 how natural gas could threaten Europe's security. It's pretty typical for military analysts to look at energy and how it can often be a source of conflict. Russia's energy dominance is an area of concern that, that NATO analysts have certainly been looking at for the past several decades. Natural gas gets used for producing electricity, gets used for heating. It's the basic element that gets used to make plastics, to make fertilizers. It's the lifeblood of a lot of industrial economies. So this is an old Soviet Union map. Here in the center, you can see some major natural gas and oil fields uh, that were developed during Soviet times. In the case of Russia, I think it's been pretty clear, especially of late, that energy often can be the precursor to a war. Tendered by President Kennedy to West Germany's chief of state. In 1963, the Kennedy administration tried to prevent the construction of the Druzhba pipeline from the Soviet Union to Eastern Europe. Manusman was providing the pipes and other equipment. The U.S. government, the Kennedy administration, told them to stop doing it, which they did. West German Chancellor Willy Brandt then ushered in the country's new Ostpolitik, thawing relations, detente, and trade. Contracts were signed for the construction of gas pipelines. Work began in 1970 on a pipeline that would finally connect Siberia with Germany. Nikolai Orodchev, Minister of the Soviet Gas Industry, celebrates a deal worth billions together with his German partners. Gas from the Soviet Union arrives at the transfer station for the first time. Go for launch. Economy Minister Friedrichs and his Soviet guests hail the gas launch as the result of normalization of relations. For the Russians, the deal was basically about hard currency that they needed because their economy was faltering and they needed the money from the West to keep the whole show going. Helmut Schmidt, Brandt's successor, also turned to Siberian gas. A second pipeline to Europe was built. During Chancellor Schmidt's visit to Moscow, German companies signed a third such contract, valid until the year 2000. Schmidt deflected U.S. President Jimmy Carter with the words, trading partners don't shoot at each other. In fact, President Carter wrote apparently in his notes that he was really tired of the U.S. providing the stick and Europeans competing to provide the carrot to incentivize uh, Soviet behavior. The U.S., Washington was looking at this saying that you're giving the Soviet Union hard currency and they're using that to build up their military and this is going to come back to haunt us. That was even an argument back then. You're making yourselves dependent on the Soviet superpower, our ideological opponent. How can you as NATO members do such a thing? The worries on the American side were about dependence, that Russia would use energy as a political weapon and that it would put Europe and Germany in a position where it couldn't stand up to the Soviet Union. And so this was all seen as part of an overall Soviet strategy uh, to weaken the West and to break up NATO. The situation in Poland then reached a boiling point. The government imposed martial law in 1981, despite protests by the Solidarność trade union. And new U.S. President Ronald Reagan reacted with sanctions to disrupt Russia's natural gas trade. The United States is taking immediate action to suspend major elements of our economic relationships with the Polish government. And we're proposing to our allies the further restriction of high technology exports to Poland. The new Soviet pipeline to Germany was built anyway. The sanctions actually were not very effective and also it divided the West. Margaret Thatcher uh, said that we're losing jobs because we're not able to supply equipment for that pipeline. 
US business wasn't happy about this. The US was also selling components. And the US argument was if we can't sell these things, then you know our competitors in Europe will sell the equipment. So in the end, they did shelve the sanctions. It's no secret that our allies didn't agree with this action. But I'm pleased to announce that the industrialized democracies reached substantial agreement on a plan of action. They did work out a compromise in, in the 1980s, which put a limit on the amount of uh, Soviet gas that went to Europe, and also ensured that there would be Norwegian gas coming to Europe so that there was some diversification. Washington tried to convince Germany to stop relying on Russian gas, but most continued to come from Siberia. As a young diplomat, I was in the Washington Embassy, and the ambassador was really proud that he'd successfully argued against the Americans' pipeline embargo. We were all inspired by the idea that what we were doing was part of the policy of improving relations. It made sense to everybody. I really don't remember anyone at the time saying, this is heading in the wrong direction. But U.S. intelligence services weren't happy. CIA Chief William Casey developed a top-secret plan with President Reagan's blessing. Vienna, the spy capital of the world. I was your typical black market dealer, especially mainframe computers measuring instruments for nuclear physics. Really delicate things that less developed states couldn't make themselves. I trained with the East German State Security, which was where I was recruited. And then, of course, after a break, I worked in the Soviet Union. The CIA watched me for over a year. Until one day, when the time was right, they decided to intervene. They said I had a choice, at least 20 years in prison, or I work for them. The CIA supplied the black market specialist with expensive high-tech goods, whose sale to the Soviet Union was banned. The Soviet Union reacted as expected. Some GRU people suddenly appeared in the hotel. Two gentlemen politely asked me to answer a few questions. That turned into a six-hour interrogation because the tech equipment had clearly been tampered with. Everything was actually compromised. I found out then that the first big computer I'd sold, a huge thing made up of cabinets, had caught fire. Reagan and his CIA chief mainly had their sights set on the Siberian pipelines. I'm convinced that a broad variety of technology was being delivered. There's a famous case of a gas pipeline that was damaged by a contaminated unit brought in from the West. The software running one of the largest gas pipelines in the Soviet Union went haywire in June 1982, just as the CIA had planned. The result was a huge explosion. The hunt was then on for the saboteurs. There's no question, if they caught me, I'd be dead. It was that simple. I was very, very happy I survived. Surviving was the greatest triumph of my life. A Russian engineer was arrested on a Moscow street in 1985. A CIA spy. He was later executed and the pipeline soon repaired. Business as usual. Vladimir Putin was at the time being trained as a KGB agent. He was sent to East Germany in 1985. And somebody asked him, what did you do in Dresden? And he said, you know, he was a KGB case officer. And he said, I was working with people and documents. Putin became a regular KGB presence in Dresden. He regularly showed up at meetings of the East German security service, the Stasi. Stasi agents often photographed Putin.
As a case officer, you have to be able to manipulate people. You have to understand people's weaknesses um, as well as their strengths. Uh, and add to that the fact that he was a judo champion. You try and sense even if your opponent is physically stronger than you, what are their other weaknesses? How can you distract them? So I think if you put those two things together, um, he probably has been quite good at manipulating people, making them feel that they're very important um, and appealing to their own vanity. Stasi officer Matthias Varnich was also active in Dresden. He'd previously spied in the West. I had a close colleague in Berlin at the time, I was in Moscow, and he had access to the Stasi files and discovered that Varnick had indeed been uh, with the Stasi. We were interviewing uh, people who knew both of them and they were able to place them in Dresden in the late 80s and said that they were working together. What we were able to ascertain was that the KGB was actually trying to recruit Stasi agents in Dresden a Stasi ID became part of Putin's disguise, and by 1989, he was looking beyond the preservation of communism. It was very, very important for establishing the business careers of a lot of different people and also probably allowing the KGB to preserve a lot of its network. He had met Stasi chief Erich Milka just a year earlier. Putin represented a powerful state that was keeping East Germany afloat with its cheap oil and gas. Natural gas was very closely related to quality of life, to warmth, to the provision of you know, services, allowing schools to function, hospitals to function. And I have used the word glue. You could describe that the cheap energy that uh, the Soviet Union was providing to its Eastern European satellites basically is a subsidy to keep their economies going and to keep them tight in the Soviet orbit. Russia was then using oil and gas as a disciplinary measure within the Warsaw Pact whenever there was conflict. I'm thinking of the uprisings in Hungary and 68 in Czechoslovakia. Moscow sent tanks to Czechoslovakia and supplied less oil and gas. Using oil and gas dependencies as a political weapon was par for the course in the Warsaw Pact. They would offer very favorable oil and gas contracts, and in return, they of course expected loyalty to Soviet interests. Exploiting these dependencies in foreign insecurity policy has a long precedent. In 1989, East Germany was on the brink of collapse. But the Soviet Union continued to demand high prices for oil and gas, which the country could barely pay. It slid deeper into crisis. The Soviets were getting all this money from Europeans, and they were seeing what the real price of energy in Europe was. And they thought, well, our economy isn't doing great. Why are we giving away our energy to these people? Agents like Vladimir Putin and Matthias Varnich had to adapt. The system they worked under was ending. Varnich landed on his feet moments after the Berlin Wall crumbled. It's fascinating how, for example, how quickly Varnik was hired by Dresdner Bank. I mean, they identified him very, very early on as someone who would be extremely useful for, for building up their business in Eastern Europe and in Russia. Former agent Vladimir Putin repositioned himself as the statue of the KGB's founder was torn down in Moscow. Putin has described that very well in interviews, how he came back from Dresden and he didn't know what to do and he was, he was moonlighting as a taxi driver on the streets of St. Petersburg. He finally landed up in the mayor's office in St. Petersburg with Mayor Sobchak. Now Sobchak was a reformer, but he was also corrupt. So you had a period there where Putin was in charge of foreign economic contacts and that's I think when he began to make money. Violence followed the collapse of the Soviet Union. The 1990s was a terrible time. It was just people trying to survive. 
Well, the key thing was protection, what the Russians call krisha, which is roof. And sometimes roof can be someone in a criminal organization. Sometimes it's uh, someone in the government. In the 90s, often that person was the same person. Former Stasi agent Varnik established contacts in St. Petersburg for Dresdner Bank, both in local government and at a new company, Gazprom. They needed someone in the St. Petersburg government who could look after them and open doors for them. That was why the, the sort of Putin-Varnik uh, connection was so interesting, because essentially Putin was Varnik's Krusha, he was his roof. Putin became more and more influential over the years, receiving dignitaries and growing his network. Meanwhile, the remnants of the Soviet Union were being bartered away. Claims were being staked. It was a sort of time of no holds barred, wild capitalism. It was the Wild East, essentially. Russian natural resources was passed to a small coterie of oligarchs or sort of extremely rich individuals in highly dubious privatization auctions. It was a really, really rough ride for Western investors, but the potential rewards were just so vast that they just kept their hand in the game. While the Russian people scoured empty supermarkets for food and lived through freezing winters, International investors were ringing up cheap Russian companies, especially those in raw materials. One object of speculation was the former gas ministry, renamed Gazprom in 1989 and a corporation since 1992. Gazprom was the most undervalued company in Russia at the time. The reason that it was so inexpensive was that everybody assumed every last cubic meter of gas was being stolen out of the company. A lot of assets were being siphoned off and given to friends and relatives of uh, senior management. This did not deter German companies. One of the biggest shareholders of gas from outside the, the government of Russia was Ruhrgas. The German company had already sold Siberian natural gas in Germany during the Soviet era, but other investors criticized the conditions at Gazprom. Every year we would run a candidate for the board of Gazprom, which was one of our people who highlight the corruption. They sat on the board, didn't of course vote for our candidate, and didn't say a word. They wanted their gas to flow, and they were absolutely unwilling to say a word about criminality. Ruhrgas dominated the European market thanks to Siberian gas. This did not sit well with BASF, its largest customer. BASF was essentially blackmailed in 1993 by Ruhrgas. Through prices that were so high, we saw our Ludwigshafen complex at risk. We decided we needed an alternative. We set up a joint venture with Gazprom to build the necessary infrastructure in Germany. We built a large network alongside the existing one, including a large storage facility, the biggest in Germany. It was a big deal. It was ultimately co-financed by Gazprom. The German government under Helmut Kohl favored such projects, partly because they propped up beleaguer Russian president Boris Yeltsin. The idea of a partnership with a Russia that had made German reunification possible was at the heart of German foreign policy, be it left, right or center. And for large stretches of the 1990s, there was nothing wrong with that. The other objective was not to leave Russia behind uh, as a sort of failing state. And you didn't want a nuclear power sort of going off on its own in some other world. Kohl forgave the debts of Yeltsin's Russia, and the natural gas flowed. Putin noticed. Putin drew the conclusion very early on that Russia's greatness was based on its extraordinary oil and gas wealth, and that needed to be deployed strategically in order to enhance Russia's great power status. 
Putin hat ja schon 1997. Putin wrote a doctoral thesis in 1997 on energy dependencies and how they could be instrumentalized in foreign policy. From the very beginning, he had developed a strong personal interest in the issue. I myself had talks with German intelligence officials who had also read it. We talked about what it actually meant. If German intelligence knew, the Chancellor's office did too. The domestic political trends were relatively clear. More state control of the energy industry, managed directly by the Kremlin. Such policy has its roots thousands of kilometers away at the Bovanin-Kovo gas field in western Siberia, an invaluable resource. Reindeer herder Maiko Serueto has led his herd through the tundra for 25 years, like generations of Nainets before him. But since the development of the gas field, Gazprom's infrastructure has made life difficult for these indigenous people. Maiko's herd is moving to the Kara Sea in the north, that's how it's always been. But the closer they get to the gas field, the more pensive these tundra nomads become. Look at the roads. That's a dead end. They also built a railroad. Soon we won't have any land left. And what happens if they close this crossing too? We won't be able to get to the other side. We'll have to spend the summer somewhere here. We've already had a bad three years in a row. The snow cover was too thick. The reindeer were so weakened that half of them died. They extract lots of gas. And sell it abroad for big money. What about us? The fate of the Nainets has always been a side issue for Gazprom, while a single man in 2000 reached a level of power no one expected. Vladimir Putin became president of Russia in the first year of the new millennium. He had already served as Prime Minister and Director of the Secret Service, the FSB. He had connections throughout the state. There were major things that Putin had to do. Uh, one was to solidify the power that the Russian government had over these industries. And it wasn't just in, in natural gas and oil. It was across the board. Putin went out of his way to put his cronies into these companies. Putin also took power economically, company by company, position by position. Then you really saw the rise of the Siloviki, the strong men, the guys from the uh, security services, who then began to occupy key positions in uh, Putin's administration. Putin also set his sights on Gazprom, at the time still a massive and unmanageable company. Then at the annual general meeting, Putin stepped into the fray and he fired Rem Vyakarev, who was the CEO of Gazprom, who was doing all the stealing along with his six or seven compatriots. And he replaced him with a new guy whose job it was not to do any stealing. His name was Alexei Miller. He was a guy that Putin knew from St. Petersburg. I remember saying to somebody in Gazprom, and a little bit irritated, who is this guy? What does he know about anything? God, you know, are these the only people that can run Gazprom, people from St. Petersburg? And the answer was, no, these are the only people that Putin trusts. But Alexei Miller was not the true Gazprom boss. Of course not. He couldn't decide alone. He could decide for Gazprom, but it still had to be voted on. And that's why certain deals took longer. We're talking about a state-owned company. Gazprom followed Putin's orders and bought a critical television station, NTV, and brought it into line. We're asking everyone, both NTV journalists and all those who incite them, to stop putting up hurdles. Critical journalists were dismissed. Protests ignored. I just wonder how our people could elect a president like that. It's horrible. 
Gazprom still owns its own glitzy broadcasters 20 years later, a dominant force in Russian media. A dedicated line leads from the station boss directly to the Kremlin. And Putin, through Gazprom, also controls private radio stations like Echo of Moscow. When Vladimir Putin came to power in 2000, he wanted to get control of independent media. He started with television, of course, but also one of our shareholders with a majority stake, Vladimir Guzinski, had his share seized in order to take out a loan from Gazprom. That's why I always say that Miller isn't our shareholder, Putin is. Gazprom isn't our shareholder, the presidential administration is. The station was banned from operating in March 2022. Just over 20 years earlier, Vladimir Putin had shown a very different face on a visit to Berlin. Many German politicians saw him as a symbol of hope. Today we must declare firmly and definitively, the Cold War is over. Objective problems aside, beneath everything beats the strong living heart of Russia, which is open to full-fledged cooperation and partnership. Thank you. When I saw the response to that speech back then, I thought it was a bit naive how people were so uncritical of a man who had been in the KGB for years. Putin won the unconditional support of German Chancellor Gerhard Schröder. This supposed opportunity for democratization didn't really exist, but that didn't change the fact that Russia was the second most powerful nuclear power on Earth, then and now. Whether you like it or not, you have to live with Russia. My attitude at the time was that we had to try to somehow integrate them on an international level. But you didn't need to have any illusions about Vladimir Putin's character. Back in Russia, Putin was having the first offices and houses of the oligarchs searched. A new power struggle was emerging. It was very humiliating for Putin and all the KGB guys to, um, to watch a bunch of nobodies in their minds, people who weren't part of the system, become so spectacularly wealthy. Well, all these KGB guys were basically, you know, paid fifty thousand dollars a year by these oligarchs to go and arrest, you know, enemies and to tr drum up fake criminal cases against business competitors, and so they had been diminished to paid servants for the oligarchs. Putin summoned the oligarchs in 2003, questioning them on live TV. One was singled out. That frustration and that bitterness came through very, very strongly in the campaign against Khodorkovsky. That was where it really crystallized because you saw, you know, the sort of the strong men in the Kremlin and in the government really target someone who for them symbolized this oligarch class, someone who had come from virtually nowhere to amass staggering wealth and to take over one of the biggest oil companies in the country. Mikhail Khodorkovsky was then head of the oil company Yukos, the market number two behind Gazprom. Khodorkovsky was regarded as a Putin critic with suspicions of state corruption. Putin's reaction was to have Khodorkovsky arrested. Yukos was accused of tax evasion. You could see in, in the kind of the campaign to destroy Khodorkovsky, there was real, there was a sort of vengeance there for all the humiliations that they had suffered uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Khodorkovsky was publicly tried. We were, at the time, following this process extremely closely because it was really the first big attack by Putin's Kremlin on private business. He was sentenced in May of 2005 to nine years in a penal camp. 
Yukos was seized and auctioned off for less than its value. Putin's associates took over the oil company, an expropriation in all but name. With the expropriation, you have to ask, how did certain people get their hands on these resources in the first place? You could say they might have had something that didn't belong to them at all. Khodorkovsky was taken to a Siberian prison camp in Russia's Far East, near the border with China. Criticism from abroad fell on deaf ears. And German Chancellor Gerhard Schröder picked a side. These reforms, ladies and gentlemen, have put Russia on a path of stable economic growth. There's not the slightest reason to engage in debates which would shake that confidence based on this or that event. German energy companies were in difficult negotiations with Russia in 2004 over access to its gas reserves, just as Putin was desperate to build a pipeline to Germany. So Western technology and partnerships were very important in terms of bringing Russia to the point where it once again became really a, an energy superpower. Putin needed technical help from Germany. Russia's pipeline network was in disrepair. They had discovered enormous fields in places like Western Siberia, but they couldn't develop them because they didn't have the capital. But German chemical company BASF did. We'd already converted the first power plant from oil to natural gas in 1997 because the Kyoto Protocol pointed very clearly towards CO2 reduction. In Kyoto, Japan, the international community reached its first binding agreement to limit greenhouse gas emissions. We adopt this text. It's so decided. And gas has an advantage. With gas, you can run a combined heat and power plant. In other words, you can exploit the resource much, much better compared to pure oil or coal burning. Putin was directly involved in negotiations between Russia and BASF. Each side needed the other. He was always very well prepared for meetings. Some go into talks without preparing. I never saw that with Putin. So many Western executives who dealt with Putin felt they were dealing not only with the president of Russia, but the CEO of Russian energy because of his knowledge, his detailed knowledge and interest and focus on energy. So he's... I mean, he's an energy guy as well as a political guy. I've actually met Putin 16 times. And what impressed me at most of those gatherings was his knowledge of all the statistics. He doesn't have to turn to any of his assistants and ask them, so he really loves energy. This guy knows about energy in a way that leaders of most countries have, have no idea. He was more the CEO of Gazprom than he was president. Putin was driven by one thing above all. We're pleased to have reached an agreement with the Paris Club, and especially with our German partners, on an early repayment of part of this debt to the Paris Club. Was the German government present at negotiations with Gazprom and Moscow? No, representatives of the German government were not there. It was really negotiated between Gazprom and BASF and other partners. It also took quite a long time. But Matthias Varnig, the ex-Stasi agent working for Dresdner Bank, was always present. These were former GIU people and on the German side, former Stasi people. And that seemed very strange and very suspicious. It confirmed us in our negative uh, instinct about this thing. Andrei Kobolyev, boss of Ukraine's oil and gas company, knew Gazprom better than anyone. I was born in USSR and I clearly understood that a company of such importance can never be just a simple company. This is part of the state. I was member of delegation from Naftagas that went to Moscow to negotiate a new gas transit contract. The person who was hosting us 
was Gazprom middle manager who, after having a couple of shots of vodka, he revealed himself as a former uh, special agent of uh, Soviet intelligence service. When I was kind of talking to myself, like, Andre, you have to be very careful. Most people around here, they are not business people. They are not gas people. These people were uh, taught and developed to spy and to steal data. If you talk to top level Russian officials from the very, very top, they will tell you there is no such a thing as former KGB guy. The British news magazine The Economist wrote in 2005 that Putin had two means at his disposal to restore Russia's former influence, nuclear weapons and gas. I think those still are the two major levers that Putin has. He's quite shrewd and he did realize that gas is one of his two main tools for coercion, for leverage, for influence. Then NATO analyst Richard Anderson wrote, Realistically, without serious concerted efforts on the part of the EU states, Russia will have the upper hand in this relationship. Quite simply, demand will remain constant, almost without regard to price. Given the choice of a cold, dark home or paying exorbitant prices, Europeans will do the latter. Construction began on a Baltic Sea pipeline at the end of 2005. The project was eventually christened Nord Stream. An event like that is always done for show, but it was still important. Today we're beginning the North European Gas Pipeline Project. Nord Stream 1 is a big deal, no question about it. I don't regret it one bit either. I don't have a problem with it at all. It was the right thing to do. It was right for BASF and it was right for Europe. We should reserve gas from Western Siberia for Europe whenever possible. Alexei Miller introduced Gerhard Schroeder as a new head of Nord Stream's shareholder committee on a cold day in December, just 17 days after he left Germany's chancellery. Did you know he would do it? No, I didn't. I talked with Angela Merkel directly. And told her Schroeder had taken the job? I told her that was the intention. What did she say? She didn't make any other comment. Angela Merkel became chancellor in 2005. The appointment of her predecessor by a Russian-controlled company raised eyebrows. When he took that job, I mean, there was considerable, I think, surprise in the United States because, and in, in other countries, because it really was very unseemly for a chancellor who had negotiated the deal, then when he's defeated in, in an election, to immediately take a job and profit very handsomely from, from it. So I think that was certainly, uh, it was received very negatively in the United States and, uh, you know, a lot of suspicion about it. The sentiment in Germany was similar. Of course it was something I would have preferred to have resolved differently. The more political a situation is, the more conflicts arise, and I didn't want that. I don't think it's right to have a leadership role with Gazprom when an ex-Stasi major is chairman of the board. In Germany's own interests, Gerhard Schröder has taken over the supervision of a project that's in our own interests in terms of energy. Schröder did not become a Gazprom lobbyist on his own. His nomination was approved. It should be someone who can represent European economic interests well, but also has a rational approach towards the majority shareholder. At the time, Schroeder embodied both those elements. Even the new chancellor, who in public was cooler towards Putin, did not distance herself from Schroeder's new job. 
I think Angela Merkel actively supported and endorsed it. I don't remember Merkel ever speaking out against it. Quite the opposite. As far as I remember, she frequently made use of the channels that went through Gerhard Schröder. I think it also provides a sense of, you know, these important people are important in countries, so it must be something important that they're doing on behalf of Russia. So it does work to both neutralize any concerns uh, that citizens would have, uh, and it also seems that they're collecting uh, this very prestigious crowd to do their business. So again, it is not just uh, Mr. Schroeder who has fallen trap into this, although he's become such a, a poster child for exactly what this looks like. From the CDU. There was no opposition from Germany's conservatives on this issue. Why not? Because the entire German economy, and especially the energy industry, wanted it. There were many supporters, not just Schroeder's Social Democrats. I can't recall any significant voices saying it was a bad idea. In Ukraine, we clearly realized that Nord Stream 1 from the very start was a project aimed at allowing Russians to play hardball against us. This is Ujarad in Ukraine, one of Europe's most important gas hubs. In Putin's mind, these pipelines were not something that Ukraine had built, they were something that the Soviet Union had built. And it drove Russia crazy that Ukraine controlled these pipelines, which was the way that its gas moved to the West. Russia tried at one point to take control of the gas transit system going through Ukraine, uh, but Ukraine resisted it. And when that f fell apart, they, they basically decided that the only solution to this situation was to go around Ukraine. I mean, it was a very a clear, concerted strategy, rational from Russia's point of view, to build pipelines that uh, reduced its dependence and ultimately eliminated its dependence on Ukraine, which Russia really regarded, or at least Putin and people around Putin, did not regard as a legitimate state. The gas pipelines run either through Poland or Ukraine. A huge network has evolved since 1970. The gas pipeline is not just one pipeline. Together, they have the capacity to transport more gas than Russia produces for the European market. The new pipeline appears to have been designed to take Ukraine and Poland out of the picture as transit countries, while still guaranteeing Germany's gas supply. The whole purpose of Nord Stream was to be able to pressurize Central and Eastern Europe. There isn't a single Ukrainian who is not a Russian ally who thinks that Nord Stream was anything other than a catastrophic and very thinly veiled attempt to by bypass Ukraine. Two weeks after construction began on Nord Stream, they have sought this conflict from the very beginning. Their policy has always been to illicitly divert gas, or to put it more simply, to steal it from European consumers. I hereby limit gas supplies to Ukraine. The flow of gas to Ukraine and Europe stopped. The 2006 conflict was very, very important as a starting point. The consequence of a relatively short cutoff of Russian gas were much greater than anyone expected. We never thought this could happen. Look, it's happened. An emergency EU meeting was convened. Uh, we should discuss uh, what has happened during those 24 hours. It happened for the first time in over 40 years of uh, constant and uh, reliable Russian gas supply. By turning off the gas, Putin was continuing a Soviet tradition. In 1991, even former Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev, hailed as a reformer, had used gas as a weapon against states moving to leave the Soviet Union. At the time, the former Soviet ambassador to Germany, Valentin Falin, developed the Falin Doctrine. It named seven instruments Russia could use to enforce its foreign policy in the future, and the most important instrument was the exploitation of energy dependencies. In the early 1990s, when there was the whole issue of how to divide the Black Sea Fleet, located in Crimea, you had these very heated discussions about what is going to happen with this fleet, how is it going to be divided. Russia threatened Ukraine with a gas boycott. 
If this cap is put in place, then we'll certainly be forced to curtail power generation. You have this perfect situation for that kind of pressure to be exerted there. They certainly were using energy as a weapon then. Different parts of Ukraine's natural gas debt vis-a-vis -vis Russia were cancelled in exchange for different percentages of that Black Sea fleet given to Russia. Mission accomplished. A 2006 publication by a Swedish colleague Larsson looked back at the 1990s, saying in more than 50 cases, Russia had exploited these exact kinds of energy dependencies for foreign policy purposes, effectively politically blackmailing other states. That's what many Europeans heavily missed. They simply did not want to accept harsh reality that they're facing new way of Russia, of impacting European Union and the Western world. <laughs>